God speaks to us in scripture, preaching, song, and prayer. A reading from Ephesians. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know God, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which God has called you, what are the riches of God's glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of God's power for us who believe according to the working of God's great power. God put this power to work in Christ when God first raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And God has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Word of God, word of life. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, 25th chapter, beginning at the 31st verse. Jesus said to his disciples, when the Son of Humanity comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, When was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, you that are accursed, Depart from me into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger or naked, or sick or in prison? and did not take care of you. Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. So since this is uh, the more liturgically authentic of the worship services we have here at uh, Our Saviors. Some of you may have noticed that the colors that Tim and I have liturgically are different than the color on the altar. Anybody notice that? (laughs) So, you know, we celebrate here seven Sundays of Advent. Uh, In a more traditional sense, this today would be the last Sunday in the season of Pentecost, and it is a festival of Christ, which is Christ the King Sunday, as we know from the text we just read. 
And white, of course, is always the color of any one of the festivals of Christ, and this is one. But we have, we have both. We have blue and, yellow, and uh, white, and they, they really work well together, so just so you be clear about that. Lord, now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight. You who are the rock, who is our faith, and you who are the, our redeemer, who brings us back again and again when we, like the sheep and the goats, have strayed. Amen. It is the Sunday after Thanksgiving. With all the everyday horrific loss of life, freedom, well-being, and peacefulness in this world, I wonder how it was for you this Thanksgiving to name those things for which you are thankful in these days, in our time of living, and in this world that God has given us to love, to care for, to oversee, and to claim as our home. How was that for you this year? How was it different than last Thanksgiving? Did the horror of war, the reality of captivity, the abuse of power, the abundance of needless death, and the struggles of mounting numbers of homeless refugees make it more difficult to express your gratitude for your family and home and house, and then stop at that? I don't know about you, but I wake up at night thinking about the ongoing march of injustice that I see and feel not only in this country, but in the brokenness of the Father's world. I think of the 23-year-old Russian woman already detained for 18 months and now at a probation hearing just this past week in Russia. She was sentenced to seven years of hard labor in a penal colony for writing five short sentences in code that were placed on food items in the Russian grocery stores. Items to symbolize her awareness of what had changed in her life and the life of her friends, experiencing the hand of a brutal dictator. Seven years of hard labor and no communication with her family or friends. I lie awake at night thinking of her, her pain, her loneliness, her faith, her mental and her physical health. I think, what can I do? Me, just me. What can I do about her situation? Am I helpless? Do you ever have such nights of restless re-examination of what God might be wanting you to do with your life, besides offering your thoughts and prayers in the most sincere manner you know? Is what I'm doing with my life today what and where God needs me most to love mercy, to do justice, and to walk humbly with my God, as the prophet Micah proclaimed to the Israelites centuries ago. The southern border, Israel, Gaza, Ukraine, Rwanda, Venezuela, Poland, and the litany of pain and oppression and death marches on. These are the desperate ones, the lost, the poor in body, mind, and spirit. What, O oh Lord, do you want me to do? What do you want from me in this our time, our time of prayer and contemplation towards action leading to justice? How do I respond to your love, O oh Lord, for me and for us all? How, Lord, how? In his book, The Kingdom of God is a Party, Tony Campolo tells the story of how the reject prom got started. John Carlson, a young Minnesota pastor, who, by the way, was known to one of the members who worshiped with us at 845. We had a nice conversation about this afterwards. He said, yeah, that's the guy. John Carlson believed that senior proms were too, exclu too exclusive to be Christian. They were reserved for the beautiful, the popular, and the dating and they left out those whom the system deemed rejects and losers. 
Is there anyone more lonely and depressed than many high school young people on prom night who haven't been invited to a party? It may be different in some places these days, but it was the case in my generation. I'm thinking that in our time, this reality may have died a sudden death since the millennials came to town, but not necessarily a bad thing, if in fact that might be partially true. Nevertheless, in this time and in his time, Preacher Carlson planned a party for these people. He called it the reject prom, designed for those who didn't have a date. It was held on the same night as the senior prom. The first one was such a blast that the senior prom seemed tame and dull by comparison. Once the reject prom got started, no one could stop it. The party began to get press coverage. Timex Corporation gave watches to all of those who attended. Other companies joined in, and those who attended the reject prom were inundated with a cornucopia of gifts and treats. Before long, some of the young people who could get dates and go to the senior prom decided to join the rejects at their party. In today's gospel, Jesus was talking to his disciples about a party, the party to which Bishop Hagmeyer made reference in her sermon in this pulpit last Sunday morning. There was a throne of glory, angels, and a king. There were the haves and the have-nots. There were the beautiful people and the rejects. There were the thirsty ones, the strangers, those who were without the required apparel. There were the homeless and those who were sick. They were all members of the same family. And in their midst, at this party, there was no apparent cornucopia of gifts. Today, many of us are reflecting upon Thanksgiving that has just come and gone, or has it gone? Yes, there was turkey, pilgrims, pumpkins, Indian corn, and much more. But it is the cornucopia that best expresses the abundance that Thanksgiving celebrates. The ancient symbol of the cornucopia was used in both Greek and Roman mythology. Some thought that the goat Amalthea, whose milk fed the infant Zeus, was said to have a thorn that was always a horn that was always filled with whatever anyone wanted to eat or drink. Other tales suggested that the Roman goddess of plenty, named Copia, always wore or carried a horn filled with fruits and drinks. The magical horn of plenty was always full. Its abundance could never be exhausted. One remarkable thing about Thanksgiving is that it has been less commercialized than other holidays on our calendar, especially Christmas and Easter. There are still many families who would never dream of saying grace before meals that suddenly feel compelled to offer up some form of thanks before carving up the fatted bird and diving into the dressing. And yet our grateful acknowledgement of abundance often has the tendency to drift into an orgy of sheer gluttony. For whatever reason, Thanksgiving has become diet conscious America's sacred day of overindulgence. One astute student of our society has observed that instead of being commercialized, Thanksgiving has been internalized and narcissized, focusing wholly on the self. And if so, we ask, what is that all about anyway? Pause for a moment and ponder the tradition. We buy butterball turkeys the size of a not so small child and spend more time trying to stuff them into our ovens than filling them with stuffing. The enormous bird is then fed to family gatherings in an overchoice society, keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller every year. Eating at least two desserts is practically mandatory at many holiday season tables. There are some here who are affected significantly by another aspect of this too much of a good thing is wonderful syndrome. Consider the consequences for family life endured by isolated spouses figuratively divorced and widowed 
and children similarly orphaned. By endless ritual and regulation, electronically manifested on playing fields hundreds of miles away from the home-based family room adjacent to the scene of the Thanksgiving dinner. In many ways, Thanksgiving has come to embody our national tendency to live beyond our means. We surround ourselves with more food and drink and amusements than we can possibly enjoy in one day. But seemingly, we refuse to give up any of it. It's hard at Thanksgiving, and it's hard at Christmas. It causes us as people of God to ask, whatever happened to, to holy in the word holidays? Might today be the moment to remember that we have been consecrated, set apart for service to others, and called for a God-given purpose in the living of our lives? And if in these unfolding 21st century days, we seem determined to live well beyond our means in our physical existence, are we likewise all too content to live beneath our means spiritually? It is the question our Lord Jesus sets squarely before us in his word on this Christ the King day. Today's epistle, which you heard read, and the gospel work together in the true spirit of thanksgiving. Paul's prayer in Ephesians celebrates the cornucopia of blessings available only through God's grace. God wants none of us believers to live a scrape-by existence or to survive on a bread and water blessing. On this Christ the King Sunday, we celebrate the fact that our victorious Lord did not suffer death and then triumphantly rise again to demonstrate that God intends our life to be a measly affair. Paul's faith compels him to impress the Ephesians with the extravagance that God wants to pour into our lives. I've come to give you life, he said, and to give it abundantly. The parable of the talents this past Sunday reminded us that God has blessed us all with many and good gifts. Part of the blessing that God intends for our lives is the joy of living within a community of faith such as our Savior's Lutheran Church is, investing the talents that we've been given for the lives of others. The Church, the body of Christ, is this community where we make a significant investment during the days of our life. Last week's question still echoes in our hearts. What will I do with these gifts that I've been given? What will be my spiritual commitment to the health and the well-being of Christ and his church here at Our Savior's Lutheran Church in the coming week, the coming month, the important coming year of 2024 in the life of this congregation. In today's gospel, Jesus differentiated between the sheep on the one hand and the goats on the other. His judgment against those who did nothing for any or all those people in desperate need reveals that there is a price tag on all of God's blessings. In return for God's gifts of love and forgiveness and salvation and redemption and adoption as his sons and daughters, there is something required of us, a new commandment, Monday, Thursday, every year, that you'll love one another, Jesus said, as I have loved you. It still calls each of us, doesn't it, to give account of our use of the gifts that we have been given for ministry. We heard the story of God's accounting of that requirement last Sunday. Yes, it is true, nothing made Jesus so angry as when good and able people treated each other badly. Nothing got Jesus' goat so much as when people of faith failed to show love for one another and not listen to one another or when they refused help or comfort or the compassion that was needed. And so we are here today, dear friends, because in Christ, the King of love, God has offered each one of us a cornucopia of blessings. How can we trust in this horn of plenty? How can we claim what God has provided for us in the living, mighty, active spirit of the risen Christ? How can we enable God's generosity to translate into a new attitude about church, about others in church, about those not in church, about those who think, remember, and see things differently than I do? What is it that may be keeping you and me stuck in the past? Yes, maybe even the best of the past. 
so that I am not celebrating the power of God's love in my life today, for today and for tomorrow. Mother Teresa once asked some visitors to hold up one hand. The gospel, she said, is written on your fingers. She insisted holding up one finger at a time. She accented each word. You did it to me. Mother Teresa then added, at the end of your life, your five fingers will either excuse you for doing it or accuse you of not doing it to the least of these. You did it to me. Jesus' judgment comes down hard on those who refuse to give of themselves. Our gospel declares that we will be judged less on what we did in our lives and more for what we did not do. The sheep did not intentionally share their goods or their love to serve Christ, but that was the result. The goats did not intentionally ignore the needs of others to deny God's power, but that was the result. They dethroned the king of love. The horn of plenty, the cornucopia that symbolizes thanksgiving as well, should and should sound the joyful noise of God's bountiful blessings to us, the abundant, overflowing graciousness that God makes available in our lives, which frees you and I to choose to serve Christ, the King. What finally counts, Henry Nouwen writes, is not whether we know Jesus and his words, but whether we live our lives in the spirit of Jesus. The spirit of Jesus is the spirit of love. Jesus makes this very clear when he speaks about the last judgment. There people will ask, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you and or thirsty and give you drink? And Jesus will answer, insofar as you did this to one of the least of mine, you did it to me. This is our great challenge, dear friends, and our eternal consolation. Jesus comes to us in the poor, in the sick, in the dying, in the captive, in the lonely, in the disabled, in the rejected. That's where he comes. That's where we meet him. And there, the door to God's house is opened for us. Maybe you should plan something like a reject prom. God is in favor of banquets, you know, that are open to all. You can help him fill the hall. You decide and who and when to act in favor of this, his call to you. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, so it is now and will always be, even unto the close of this age. Amen.